Hello, everyone. Hello, world. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar. So I'm going first to uh, first introduce uh, this uh, global challenge, uh, gro global uh, round in Japan. And then um, I can uh, go to uh, my uh, talk. So the first, uh, like the other country, so Japan is pushing this, uh, you know, supporting ITU's uh, AI and machine learning 5G uh, challenge. And we have uh, this website created. Uh, if uh, you go to this website, you can find uh, more information, but uh, I have only few minutes to introduce our activity here. So just uh, to briefly uh, recap uh, what uh, is happening in Japan is, is that uh, like the other country, we will have a contest uh, already uh, actually started, but we uh, prepared three uh, problem sets. Uh, theme one is from KDDI, theme two is from uh, NEC, and uh, theme three, this is from rising. I'm gonna explain what the rising means uh, in a minute. But uh, this uh, KDDI is offering a very interesting uh, uh, problem set and uh, also NEC is uh, coming from uh, raw video data streaming uh, type of a uh, problem set. And we're gonna dive into the detail uh, later after uh, two uh, professors talk, uh, including me. And uh, the theme three is, is not explained here because it's not for a final conference of ITU. Maybe you can find uh, more information uh, in this website. So just to uh, let, let you know that uh, we have this uh, contest running uh, you know, from uh, July 15th and ending at uh, October uh, 21st. But in between, we have uh, uh, several events. So the registration deadline is end of this month, but you know, in, it's actually the day after tomorrow. But we we'll probably extend uh, this uh, maybe uh, Right, Thomas, maybe. And uh, <clears throat> the registration deadline uh, for um, the theme three is a little bit uh, later. And a submission deadline for a problem set is uh, September 20th. And then uh, the, all the submissions will be evaluated. And then, uh, you know, winners uh, will get the prize, I guess, from KDDI and NC, maybe from ITU as well. So important date to remember is, is that you know, you should uh, register to, uh, you know, uh, to solve this uh, problem sets and uh, get a winning uh, prize. Uh, and the submit submission is, again, you know, important date is uh, September 20th. So before um, <clears throat> going into my talk, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit about rising. The Rising is a community. It's a cross-field research association of a super intelligent networking. It's actually uh, supporting this uh, global challenge activity. So I didn't uh, explain the organizers here. ITU, of course, and the Rising is the main, uh, you know, community to support this activity. TTC and KDDI, NEC, and 5G MF. So this is the organization which is promoting the mobile network uh, in Japan, uh, especially 5G and beyond. Okay, so um, so this uh, rising community is uh, cross uh, field. That means that from wired to wireless access network, uh, end to end communication, we like to apply the uh, machine learning technique to uh, network operation, and especially uh, like to you know work on this uh, you know, autonomic uh, uh, network operations using uh, machine learning and AI. So this is the perfect match for uh, this uh, type of contest. So we decided to support this activity. So we have been working uh, together to uh, get this uh, contest uh, happening. Okay, so today's webinar's agenda, as uh, Thomas uh, already mentioned, <coughs> we have part one, uh, invited talks. Uh, we have two talks. And after that, part two, the problem sets into the action in this uh, global challenge. Okay. All right. So maybe we can switch gear to uh, my talk. So my talk is about advanced uh, traffic classification through in-network uh, machine learning. So because uh, we have uh, only 20 minutes for our time slot uh, for this talk, uh, I can um, go a little bit quick. 
uh, but try to uh, cover a basic uh, uh, notion of a machine learning applied to uh, networking as well, because uh, this is my uh, this is our first talk. So uh, brief uh, self introduction. I'm Akin Nakao at the uh, I'm teaching at the University of Tokyo. I'm uh, I have a role of advisor to the president of the University of Tokyo and a vice dean of my department. And I'm a chairman of a 5G MF networking community, a committee, and a chairman of a local 5G. Local 5G is a private 5G uh, networking. Uh, the name is a little bit different from other countries, but uh, local 5G means the private uh, 5G band uh, networking. And I'm also a chairman of this committee. And I'm uh, playing uh, various roles in uh, ministry of the Japanese government. I'm also doing CTO of my own company. Okay, so because uh, we do a lot of 5G uh, stuff, so in fact, uh, in this last spring, uh, Japan has started uh, commercial 5G services. Uh, but before then, we did a lot of uh, uh, you know, 5G experiment. So today, the third speaker, the Otani-san from KDDI, we work together to uh, make this uh, great uh, <coughs> uh, experiment of 5G. Uh, this is, you know, flying drone and uh, loading this uh, 5G tablet with the 4K camera. So we capture the uh, object on the ground and uh, send it to the ground and play it on the PC through the 5G uh, 28 gigahertz millimeter wave band. Okay, this was uh, done in 2018, two years before uh, 5G actually uh, is commercialized. So we are premature, <coughs> we are using the premature equipment, uh, but we actually succeeded to uh, deliver the live feed uh, of, so this is taken at some event. So there are 3000 cyclists in this screen, but the live capture the video can be delivered to, uh, to the ground or in real time. So because of my PC's uh, you know, screen resolution, uh, it's not 4K, but it's actually 4K uh, video feed. And you can, uh, you know, because uh, 5G can deliver a large amount of data, uh, high bandwidth, so uh, we can uh, have uh, this uh, crisp, uh, very clean, uh, clear screen uh, capture here. <coughs> and also we did uh, another experiment uh, last year. So. So this is a 8K live streaming. Uh, well, there's a there's a little, little bit typo. It's not 8G, uh, 8K live streaming with a 5G for remotely monitor race horses. So the same idea, but we fly a drone with an 8K camera and load it with the 5G UE and send in the, you know the live image of the uh, horses uh, raised in this farm. And also in uh, Staples, uh, we have. Uh, about 250 uh, horses, but uh, we uh, you know live stream this uh, by 8K, and uh, we are uh, I mean the owners of the horses can remotely check the health of these uh, horses. It's a great application to support um, like uh, this uh, type of uh, industry. So another experiment that we did is a live video streaming and the real time control of underwater draw. So in the southern part of uh, Japan, we have a large oyster farming uh, field. And uh, this is actually on the uh, sea. And oyster farming rafts are uh, hanging all these uh, you know, large number of oysters. But usually fishermen go there to check the oysters, uh, health of the oysters, uh, but it takes uh, time and efforts. So we decided to uh, work with Docomo to enable 5G uh, enable underwater drone uh, live video streaming to check the oysters uh, health and uh, connecting uh, the uh, underwater drone with wire to get the feed, video feed uh, to the port and from port uh, we do a 5G uh, video uh, streaming transmission uh, to the base station on the seashore. So by doing this uh, we can uh, <coughs> uh, remotely monitor uh, these oysters, but at the same time, we can operate draw by very low latency of the 5G communication. So ultra low latency, ultra reliable and low latency communication. Uh, this is a great uh, use case uh, for uh, 
28, uh, mm, 28 gigahertz millimeter wave band. So this is a live feed uh, in the recorded uh, live uh, video. And um, <clears throat> it's actually, uh, so the place location uh, is like this. So uh, we have uh, 5G CPE and a 5G base station. Uh, it's about 100 meters, 150 meters away uh, from each other. And we can uh, tr transmit about a 400 uh, mega BPS uh, 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 wireless communication. So you can uh, transmit uh, you know, 4K or even 8K uh, video uh, here. So the fishermen are very happy about this application. And uh, we decided to um, uh, use this, uh, you know, this year uh, as a viable use case for 5G. Okay, so I introduced uh, all these experiments to justify what we are doing uh, in the network. So let me explain this uh, network slicing idea. <coughs> so I think, uh, you know, several of you are already are familiar with the network slicing but uh, this is about a network slicing on a per application basis. So usually people are talking about a network slicing per UE, user equipment, uh, but we think that a user equipment based uh, network slicing is, is, uh, is not enough. Okay, so usually without a network slicing, so EMBB enhanced mobile broadband traffic, actual reliable and low latency communication traffic and massive machine type communication, MMTC traffic. This is basically IoT. So these uh, traffic are mixed all together from a radio access network to a core network to transport network and any app in uh, cloud. So the application with different QoS requirements uh, share the same entity and communication channel. So you can uh, easily guess that it's not a good idea. So it's like a highway, uh, you know, accommodating a bicycle, bike, uh, you know, all kinds of track and cars and all kinds of track mixed together. So it's not, um, there is a greater interference uh, that could happen uh, within the network. But with a network slicing on per application basis, so we can uh, virtualize this uh, physical uh, layer network uh, from RAN to core to transport, and we can create a sort of slice uh, application with different QoS requirements are isolated into slices. So in 5G, we think that uh, we like to, uh, you know, enable this uh, five, uh, UE, not only UE, but also a per application basis uh, uh, slicing. <clears throat> okay. So how do we do that? So we take uh, entity and communication. This is uh, we developed this technology in the 5G Pagoda project. Uh, the 5G Pagoda's view uh, on a future mobile infrastructure. This, this is a joint work uh, between uh, Japan and the European countries. And we built this uh, uh, system that can create application-based uh, uh, network slicing. So taking the uh, physical layer network, uh, we can uh, create uh, multiple virtual networks uh, isolated uh, from each other. And each slice can uh, uh, contain a CDN uh, slice, advanced ITS slice, and IoT uh, M2N slice. So looking back, you know, you can uh, consider the examples that I show, the drone control and uh, uh, video streaming. So they can be on the same network, same physical network, but because of uh, this network slicing per application, we can isolate those uh, traffic uh, from each other so that uh, you can have um, better QoS uh, per uh, application uh, communication. So this is a basic idea. So how can we enable this uh, application uh, per application basis uh, network slicing? We have to classify the traffic uh, wisely within a network. So when we look at the mobile network architecture, so there is the best point to do this job. So it's called a public gateway that is sitting between a radio access network and a core network. So it's like a choke point here. All the traffic are going through this public gateway. So EMBB traffic, ULLC, and MMTC traffic, you know, 
are going through this public gateway. So if you capture these characteristics of the traffic and apply the deep learning, so we can classify uh, these application traffic and then apply the different QoS. And also you can do apply the network functions per application uh, flow. So the problem is uh, uh, called uh, application identification. So the traffic classification, in the end, uh, you know, we have to you know, identify application from a given uh, traffic. So, and then uh, after we do application identification, uh, we can do application specific uh, spectrum uh, allocation at the radio access network. And uh, core network, we can do application specific data processing. So this can open the door to a more uh, interesting and useful uh, application processing uh, per uh, slice. So this is the basic idea. So now, how can we use uh, deep learning or machine learning in this uh, classification of the traffic? That's the question. So this is the research uh, started uh, three years ago. And uh, we use, we first uh, tried to use the smartphones uh, traffic because uh, you know, your smartphone, I'm, uh, you know, I'm holding the smartphones here. You install a lot of applications on these smartphones, but uh, we have to uh, get a supervising data. So we modify the smartphones a little bit so that we can add an application tag uh, here at the very first packet. If you are using TCP uh, communication, TCP SIM packet is the first packet you uh, exchange for, between a server and client. So uh, we attach application tag uh, to the very first TCP SIM packet to create the supervising uh, data. You know, we do a feature extraction and uh, we update the classifier using this uh, uh, supervising feature and uh, traffic classification can be done to the regular packet and we can um, do uh, deep learning. You know, we send a feature data to uh, cloud and do deep learning, uh, cloud or uh, mobile edge cloud. Uh, we can do a deep learning and get the result back to the classifier and we update the classifier so that we can train the traffic uh, classification engine. And uh, this is the regular packet not tagged but uh, we can uh, do application tagging uh, here. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, after classification, uh, we can do application specific uh, uh, data processing. So how we do uh, feature extraction and uh, update classifier is a question now. So first, uh, you know, let's look at the supervising data. We distributed the 60 uh, free forms to uh, students you know, we can always exploit, uh, exploit the students. Uh, they are very interested in using the free phones. So uh, we uh, modify the smartphones and hand it over to our students so that we can create a supervising data. So we have, you know, accurate breakdown of the real mobile virtual network operator traffic. We ask a mobile net virtual network operator to uh, install our machinery of uh, this uh, feature extraction and classifier and all that deep learning engines. And, uh, you know, this is just the breakdown of the traffic, but using this uh, supervising data, we uh, match up the uh, features of the, or characteristics of uh, traffic uh, with application name, like a media server, Android car, and uh, YouTube, tethering, and all these uh, kind of applications uh, we know the uh, features uh, matched up with the application name. And using this uh, data, so we do the uh, first uh, trial is a random forest. So if you are familiar with the random forest, uh, you don't have to listen to my, uh, you know, talk uh, using the next uh, couple of slides. You know, we take a packet and we extract a feature like destination IP, destination port and protocol TTA, packet size and packet interval. These are called features, and we uh, do a random forest approach and a classifier, <coughs> classify the, uh, this uh, traffic into uh, applications. So like uh, advertisement, dynamic mapping, automotive uh, driving, emergency notification, and all these. So 
if you are not familiar with the random forest, I can do a real quick introduction of random forest. So if you are familiar with the decision tree, so the random forest is just very easy to understand. So decision tree, so if you want to classify black dots and the white dots, which have a certain characteristics. So for the simplistic uh, uh, purpose, we can uh, say, okay, characteristics one, uh, that is uh, on, a, on a scale of zero to one, and let's call it X, and characteristics two, if let's call it Y. And uh, if we uh, learn to classify the white dots, so then you can say X is, is over like a certain threshold uh, alpha, and Y is uh, over beta, right? So then you can capture all these uh, white dots. But there are some black dot here, and white dot is uh, you know outside this uh, region. So if you create a decision tree, the classification accuracy is only eighty percent because of these because of these uh, uh, unclassified uh, you know misclassified uh, dots here. But if you use a random forest, so then you can capture all these white dots here and include that here. And classification accuracy becomes 94% here. And we use ensemble uh, technique here. What is ensemble learning? So let's uh, take a student's example. So we have uh, smart students, not so smart students uh, in school. So, uh, but uh, you know, let's suppose that we have three students here. So, you know, each student is, you know, if you give a 10 questions and against the correct answer, you know, the first student can answer like 60% of, uh, you know, the correct answers. Student two, also 60%. Student three, also 60%. But if you give the uh, students um, a chance to uh, talk to each other, so they vote among, uh, you know, each other. So then, so if you vote, so then that, you know, student one and student th three says, okay, the first question is a black dot. So then a vote result is black dot. So if you, uh, you know, collect all these uh, voting results, so then it becomes 90%. So even though individual student is very weak, like 60% uh, of, uh, you know, correct answers, but uh, we can uh, collect them and, uh, you know, let them vote among uh, you know, students. So then uh, we can achieve 90% of uh, correct answers. So let's, uh, you know, replace the student with the decision tree here. So then uh, we can uh, do the same thing, but instead of scores, uh, we can give accuracy. So we can achieve 90% uh, of accuracy by using this uh, weak uh, classifier. So this is the idea of ensemble learning, and we apply that for, uh, for you know, random forest. But there is a caveat here. So if you uh, have a bad choice of weak classifiers, just like, uh, you know, all the same identical uh, decision tree, so then uh, voting result is, um, is, is not great. You know, you know you, even if uh, you are collecting uh, many, many uh, decision trees together, so then you can achieve only 60%. But a good choice of uh, you know weak classifier, we can achieve ninety percent. So the idea here is is that you know we have to collect you know uh, decision trees which are not very much uh, correlated. So this is the idea of random forest. So we given the data set, so we do random sampling and create uh, several sets and doing the decision trees. And then uh, we uh, collect them together to do uh, ensemble learning to create a random forest. So if you use that, we uh, take uh, 20 features of the traffic flows, and I don't have time to list them, that, them up, call them up all, but the yellow cells features design uh, based on a trace and white cells are used by some other existing work, but we increase the number of uh, characteristics and uh, using only header information, we can achieve uh, like um, up to 85% uh, of accuracy by learning period of uh, 14 days. But if you're allowed to do a payload analysis, so then uh, we can achieve uh, almost like 93%. You know? So this is the power of a random forest. And this is the, probably the, the first choice of applying a, the machine learning to a uh, traffic classification. So if you're 
try to do uh, you know, this uh, traffic uh, classification. So the run for this is always your friend. So next, you know, briefly, a uh, deep learning approach. So unlike a random forest approach, we do a so-called a deep uh, neural network approach. So the first uh, step is, you know, the same thing, a feature of vectors. We create a feature of vectors and feed it to the input layer of a deep neural network. And train model we use uh, in the DNN is defined with an input layer, multiple uh, fully connected hidden layers and an output layer. Each hidden layer is a you know, feed for neural network. And output layer is built with a softmax regression mode. So if you're not familiar with the softmax, so it's like smooth uh, function of uh, the maximum uh, argument uh, uh, function. Uh, I'm not have to, you know, I'm not gonna explain this due, due to the time constraint, but uh, we do uh, some technique to uh, increase the probability of the output layer showing uh, you know, correct uh, application by uh, inferred. And uh, using this uh, deep learning, so this is the very simple results. So we take um, you know, input vector as server IP server port and prototype as a reference. And we, if we add new uh, features to this input vector, for example, in the first case, we add a client IP client port, but uh, compared to the um, vector one and a vector two, vector two is that, you know, in addition, we have a client IP and client port added. So it's not increasing, you know, the accuracy much. So the feature client IP client port has almost no impact on identification accuracy. But uh, nice thing about this deep neural net is, is that, you know, we have unexpected result here. Unexpected uh, feature that we found is a TTL, time to live. So time to live is it the how many hops of routers you, you, you have to go through to get to the server. So the application is uh, hosted uh, in some server, which is several hops away from the mobile phone. So it has a you know, greater correlation uh, with a TTL, the number of hops to go through. So we didn't think about that first, but uh, if you feed a TTL, so the accuracy jumps up from 60% uh, to 80%. Uh, so 20% of uh, increase, that's uh, amazing. But then I will, you know, looking back, Okay, maybe TTL explains, okay, so it's correlated with uh, uh, application because the, you know, the application is usually fasted at some uh, certain uh, server, which is you know, a particular number of hops away. And likewise, the packet size, we didn't uh, think that the packet size can affect any accuracy, but a 10% of increase. So then we try to explain this, but probably it's a useful feature because client server need to exchange information. Well, this is, uh, it, okay, I didn't explain in detail, but packet size of the first five packets from the initial, you know, packet exchange. So we feed uh, it's a five packet size and uh, as an input vector and I try to, uh, you know, calculate the validation accuracy. So it's probably because the client server need to exchange information during connection uh, establishment, but the size of exchange information is application specific. So by doing this, uh, we can uh, uh, conclude that, okay, so unexpected human, uh, you know, didn't expect uh, such uh, features can affect this accuracy increase, but uh, we uh, now know that, uh, now know that the TTL and the packet size of the initial uh, communication can affect accuracy in a, you know, great uh, deal. So, uh, so by doing this uh, deep neural network, so we can get like an unexpected uh, result, but that makes sense, you know, if you look back and think uh, more about it. So this is the, uh, my, our uh, you know, experience by uh, using the deep learning to the uh, advanced budget, uh, uh classification. Okay, so I don't have time. So this is my last slide. So in my, uh, this uh, talk, um, I wanted to say that 5G and beyond 5G, the fine grain network slicing becomes very important. 
because uh, network requirement varies significantly per application. So advanced uh, traffic classification uh, using machine learning uh, without privacy violation, this is a very uh, significant issue in Japan, especially is a viable use case to uh, demonstrate the power of machine learning. In network machine learning, it's powerful means to uh, derive useful file level information, especially in 5G and beyond 5G, because we have lots of data in the network. Traffic user data, network operational data, and the human behavior data, like uh, usage of UE application, etc. And the last point, this is important for students. Uh, tangible example use cases, such as, uh, you know, today I introduced a traffic classification, uh, you know, which is very simple uh, problem, but a suitable and attractive for educational purpose. For example, my students are you know very interested in this problem, and uh, you know I explain today only the basic stuff. But uh, if you uh, look at uh, you know our uh, publication record, we have uh, interesting problem, more complex examples. So this is like a lower barrier to entry to a machine learning AI application to networking. So I believe that I posit that such examples would accelerate research and education on this uh, subject. So uh, I recommend that uh, starting from a you know, very simple but uh, interesting looking problem and I try to uh, apply machine learning and AI to um, networking. Okay, thank you very much for attention. Uh, I went a little bit over time. Uh, but I uh, hope uh, you liked uh, uh, my talk. And I hand over to the Professor Yamamoto for interesting uh, wireless talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Nakao, for the interesting talk. Uh, if, someone, if people have questions, please, uh, you can submit them in the Q&A uh, window so that we can take them at the end of these talks. Now I invite uh, Professor Yamamoto to give us uh, a talk on machine learning for wireless LANs. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, it's a great honor for me to present here today. So today uh, my talk is on machine learning for wireless LANs. Uh, this is a short version of uh, a tutorial held in IEEE ICC last year. So first, I'd like to introduce the relation with uh, ITU 5G challenge. So as uh, in the Professor Nakao's talk, uh, we have uh, three themes in Japan round. And uh, uh, in one theme, uh, we have location estimation from Wi-Fi RSSI. So this is Japan round only and not eligible for final conference. But uh, in this talk, uh, I like to explain uh, applications of deep supervised learning and uh, reinforcement learning of uh, uh, wireless LANs. Uh, uh, in wireless LANs, there are uh, microwave and millimeter wave wireless LANs. So uh, I, will, uh, I will explain both of them. So in part one, I will explain the deep uh, supervised learning in part, in, uh, part one. And also in part two, I will explain the enforcement run. Okay, I'd like to start with this part. And this work is mainly uh, conducted by uh, Professor Nishio and also my uh, PhD candidate, Mr. Koda. In this work, we tackle the uh, human body blocking problem in millimeter wave communications. As you may know, uh, millimeter wave communication is utilized for 5G and wireless uh, for to increase the uh, communication data rate. Uh, but uh, it uh, millimeter wave communication suffers from strong attenuations due to human blocking. So if the if there is a, uh, we assume this communications between this client and access point. And if there is a, a humans between them and, and this human makes a shadow for these communications, then the uh, received, uh, th this is a throughput of these communications and the received uh, throughput is uh, significantly degraded due to such human blocking. So we like to uh, deal with such kind of blocking by using 
neural network, deep neural networks. So the key idea here is to use deep learning and the camera images. So uh, the, we like to predict the received power in five millise uh, 500 milliseconds ahead. Here, the horizontal axis represents the time and uh, the red line, red curve represents the uh, 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 predicted, uh, predicted received signal strength and the blue curve is the uh, measured uh, received power. Here, uh, we can estimate by using these depth images, uh, we can estimate the 500 milliseconds ahead uh, received power. So can you imagine how we make it? So let me, let me explain how to enable the prediction with deep learning. So in this, uh, in this work, uh, we treat the prediction program as a regression program uh, from the camera images to future received power. We utilize this complicated, relatively complicated neural networks so I like to explain the uh, regression, regression by using neural networks, by using quite simple linear regression program from single input X to single output Y. Here we assume single simple perceptron with linear activation function. Uh, this is very elementary level uh, discussion. And uh, this simple perceptron first summarizes these uh, multiple inputs and then uh, take activation function phi. So here we assume that is uh, relatively uh, simple problem. So we only assume a uh, simple input x and the linear activation function. Then this neural networks explain uh, is equivalent to this very simple uh, linear, uh, linear, equ linear equation. By using the uh, PyTorch uh, framework, we can use uh, this uh, code explains this uh, simple uh, uh, line, linear function. So, and we like to uh, use, we like to train this kind of neural network. So this, this is a received power prediction by using uh, images. So we write, there is a, uh, we like to make a function F1 between the uh, input data to future power. So this is function is a neural network and uh, we like to train such neural network by using graveled data. In contrast, in linear regression program, uh, we like to uh, train this function, namely, the uh, weight W and bias B by using label the data set. Here we assume this very simple uh, data set. And here I like to show you uh, Google Cloud. And just a minute. Uh, okay, here. So this is a simple regression program, but we utilize a uh, machine learning framework. So now first use uh, libraries and made a random data set and plot. So here we utilize, here we utilize very simple uh, data set and uh, preparing the neural network, uh, prepare for training. Here we utilize a stochastic row gradient to descent and we squared error. Then train the neural network. Okay. After that, the neural network explains here. So the this orange curve represents the uh, output or estimated output of neural network. This is equivalent to linear regression. But uh, it is uh, for complicated problem, it is same uh, framework. So I like to return to slide. Okay. 
So if we if we uh, increase the number of input, then we utilize the number of layers, or we increase the number of uh, neurons in each layer. So we can say this is a deep network. So uh, we can increase the number of neurons and layers by adding many uh, lines like this. So the problem, uh, the, so up to now, I explained the neural networks utilized for deep learning. Then the problem is uh, preparing the data set for training that neural networks. Uh, we uh, measure the uh, received power and also take depth images at each timing. So we have such measured data set. So um, we like to uh, train such neural networks by using this uh, measured data. But how can we estimate, how can we predict Five millisecond, uh, five hundred millisecond ahead uh, received power by using these steps images. The solution is simple. So we prepare. So we utilize the input. Uh, we uh, organize this measured data as out input data and output data. So here we utilize this uh, this in, uh, image sequences from now uh, from now to uh, so past sequence. So we utilize this past sequence as input and 500 milliseconds ahead received power as output. By preparing such uh, training data set, we can uh, and we put this uh, uh, data set to the neural networks explained in this uh, figure. Uh, we successfully estimate the future received power. This is the technique of uh, our received power estimation. Also, we can say the so we like to know why this kind of estimation can be uh, realized. So important point here is in this depth image, uh, there is uh, this uh, sequence contains the velocity of such uh, human body. Thus, we can say such neural network can estimate the position of 500 milliseconds ahead and also estimate the received power at this time. So this is important point of this uh, deep learning. For, uh, deep learning. So let's move on to the second part, uh, deep reinforcement learning for YSLANs. The first part is uh, mainly done by my former PhD student, Dr. Kamiya. And also a uh, second part, a uh, second uh, work is conducted by uh, Mr. Koda. So let me start with very simple program here. So let me assume uh, there are five access points. Uh, this, these squares represent access points. And we have uh, only two channels, radio frequencies. So we like to optimize the aggregated throughput of these access points. So this is quite simple. So this alternate uh, channel allocation. So blue and red represents the uh, frequency channel, and these uh, two channel allocations are equivalent. So, but uh, we, we can easily uh, understand the, such uh, channel allocations are optimal. But uh, here, uh, we like to discuss a little bit of different problem. So we like to find the optimal sequence from initial state to the optimal state. So imagine there we, we have such initial state, all access point chooses the same channel. And we like to find the minimum sequence to change the channel. Here, we assume only one access point can change its channel at a given time. And also the throughput uh, reward in this uh, program 
can be observed only after channel location. So how can we solve this problem? The, so what you see here uh, is the example sequences. So in this first sequence, uh, access point to two and access point four changes their channel to the final uh, optimal uh, channel allocation. So this is optimal and desirable. On the other hand, if uh, access point three, uh, one and five changes the channel, this uh, sequence also achieves the uh, uh, optimal uh, channel allocation, but it takes three time sequences, time uh, times. So we like to find uh, this uh, sequence rather than this sequence. So how can we do that? So let me get uh, let me get straight to the point. The solution is deep reinforcement learning with graph convolution. This uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning contains three factors. Reinforcement running, deep running, I have already discussed, and graph convolution. So I like to start with uh, reinforcement running with very simple uh, example. So as a simple application, as for reinforcement running, I like to explain by using tic-tac-toe. Uh, in the tic-tac-toe, uh, and we uh, here we assume the we are the second player node. So in the sec for the second player, uh, check the state first state. So first player puts cross here, then second player take action and put a node here, then uh, the second player uh, observes the next state. Also, we uh, there's a next action and next state. So we get such sequence without the sequence. So we have the uh, state action reward and state. Uh, here, <laughs> uh, I forgot to discuss the uh, reward, but uh, uh, such uh, these uh, players win or lose, so they get the reward. So based on such uh, sequence we like to uh, find the best uh, action. The approach is, I guess you, know, you may already know, uh, reinforcement running and the tabular queue run. In tabular queue running, uh, we uh, prepare action by function and we put, uh, we prepare uh, all states here and uh, each state represents the state of uh, state of board, and uh, they also uh, we take, uh, prepare action here. And if in this state uh, the second player should put node here, so the this part this point G, so the this uh, cell should have high high uh, value for expected expected reward. So we like to prepare this kind of, so we like to learn uh, or acquire this optimal uh, table by you only using the observed sequence. So also I like to explain by using Google Cloud. <laughs> I forget to send the uh, URL. Uh, so I will send the last one and also send this uh, this one. So if if you like to do yourself, please do yourself. So I will change the screen and uh, okay. So this is a QRAN for very simple tic-tac-toe. And uh, this is a, a this is a, a program by other uh, programmers. So first import libraries, oh, oh, no. import libraries, and uh, use, uh, this is a tic-tac-toe program, program, and determine Q table, update rule of Q table, and first uh, clear Q table. And after that, uh, 
I will here I will show you the Q table of this of this uh, state. So execute Q running. So the higher values, so um, this uh, green uh, cell represents a uh, uh, good uh, cell to good action for this state. So we can estimate, we can uh, learn uh, this, uh, this cell should be, uh, this action should be take after uh, learning. In this case, uh, we take one uh, 10,000 uh, episode or uh, episode for learning. And as you can see here, we need around uh, 10,000 or more is required to uh, efficiently update this uh, table. So let's return to the slide. So here in this case, we need very large number of uh, sequence. And uh, it is due to the uh, very large space for state. But uh, it is not <laughs> enough time, so I like to skip the detail. But even in tic tac toe, this Q table is very large. And in very simple wireless LAN system, and even in number of access points is four, and the number of channels is two, the state space is large, and the access point, 10, 10 access points and three channels are impossible. So we need uh, different reinforcement learning here. So here we utilize the function approximation by using deep neural networks. We can say this kind of reinforcement learning is deep reinforcement learning. Also, we utilize graph convolution for feature extraction, but uh, and, uh, uh, this is a uh, same analogy, uh, analogy for uh, learning from images. So in uh, learning using images, we utilize convolution neural networks. And in this case, we, we uh, consider graph-like uh, input. So we utilize good, uh, uh, graph convolution networks as feature extraction. So we utilize this kind of uh, neural networks and uh, successfully achieve the uh, best actions for this kind of channel allocation sequence. So I'd like to move on to the uh, last part. So in this uh, work, uh, our students uh, try to find the uh, best base station to hand over. So we assume there are two base stations and by using deep reinforcement running and also same as in the first discussion, we utilize this kind of the, uh, depth images. And here, this uh, blue part, this blue part, uh, the uh, direct path is de uh, degraded by uh, human blocking and uh, in, here, we utilize only received power and without camera images. And in this case, uh, the uh, vertical axis represents the Q values or Q function for each, uh, for each access point or base stations. And here, uh, we utilize the, uh, the Q value for uh, base station one. And in this point, uh, the Q value has been changed from uh, base station one to two. So we, need, we can say a handover should be conducted. But uh, it is after the uh, human blocking. But by using camera images, uh, the Q value has been decreased before the, uh, before the uh, blocking. So the Q value decreases before the blocking and we can uh, hand over before the blocking. So uh, we can uh, offer uh, such uh, stable communications, even in millimeter wave communications. 
So uh, I'd like to summarize my talk. So uh, I, my, in my talk, uh, we utilize deep neural networks for uh, 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 distributed power prediction and also handover and channel allocations. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Yamamoto, for the nice, uh, wonderful talk. Now, because of time, we will move first into the second part of the webinar, introducing problem statement from Japan. So I invite uh, Otan-san to introduce uh, the first part, uh, which is a problem statement from KGDI. Over to you, Otan-san. So let me start uh, my uh presentation about uh, uh, KDDI problem statement. My name is Tomo Otani from KDDI Corporation and KDDI Research. So our problem statement is uh, entitled as analysis on route information failure in IP core networks by NFB based test environments. So this is the agenda of my uh, presentation. Firstly, I would like to introduce a uh, data set uh, information. This is the mo most uh, important uh, information today, tonight. And I would like to uh, introduce how to use uh, the data set, um, the meaning, uh, how we collect uh, the data. And then uh, we would like to introduce a network configuration for evaluation use case of analysis. And uh, finally, I will conclude by saying uh, submission way for, for the problem for this challenge. And th this is a uh, uh, slide indicating uh, data set uh, information. We have two types of uh, data, sets, data set for learning and evaluations uh, to participate, the participants. And we have two categories as uh, label and data. Label means uh, kind of uh, teacher data, uh, uh, no, uh, answer data, uh, real uh, failure data. Uh, file name is failure management. And this file includes uh, event data and event types which are listed along the time series. And the data format is a JSON format. And we have three types of uh, data for learning, uh, virtual infrastructure, physical infrastructure, and network device uh, file names. Those are uh, the data related with performance monitoring uh, on virtual network functions and physical server uh, physical servers and network monitoring information like uh, BGP route information gathered from network elements. And those uh, files are JSON format and uh, each data has a timestamps. But uh, one of our files uh, is based on UTC, but other three uh, files are based on the GST. So <laughs> please care uh, about the difference of time zone uh, depending on files. So please uh, convert uh, maybe UT from UTC to uh, GST. Sorry for this inconvenience. And uh, this slide shows how we collect uh, the data in our NFB environment. We intentionally add uh, failure in the network and then collect uh, the network uh, data from various devices, various uh, uh, physical, logical uh, devices. And uh, we, we add a new failure. Uh, once we add a failure, we wait for a while. In this slide, we wait for five minutes to, to be stabilized in networks. And then we recover uh, the network to normal state. And we wait for five minutes to be stable 
and we uh, periodically uh, repeat uh, this uh, process uh, over over many times, so we can get uh, the data uh, from uh, by by using this uh, method. If we can see the actual operational environment, we can collect the data, but it will take a long, very long time to to be enough for machine learning and AI. So we accelerate uh, to collect the data set. We utilize an NFV uh, test environment uh, in addition to uh, actual environment data. And this is the uh, how to use the data set. And as I mentioned, we have uh, two types of data sets for learning and evaluations. So each data set has uh, each uh, JSON files. And participants need to uh, data pre-processing for training and evaluations. So a participant can utilize uh, data set files for learning. And once uh, participants train uh, the data model, by using a data set file for learning, the participant can utilize uh, data set files for evaluation uh, according to the developed uh, data, uh, mod data model after training. So uh, participants can uh, evaluate uh, their data model, which uh, created by using uh, data set files for learning. And this is the uh, network topology. Some people may not familiar with uh, uh, networking technology, but uh, in order to participate in uh, this uh, challenge, uh, please understand uh, what a network uh, topology means of what IP network uh, means uh, at least. But not, not uh, uh, special, uh, not, 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 uh, not, not expert uh, experience, but uh, very uh, uh, basic uh, skills. And we assume uh, 5G core network attached to uh, IP backbone, uh, IP backbone network. And uh, we have a bunch of uh, internet gateway router. Here we have the two internet gateway router, number one, number two. And those routers are paired with other uh, domains, IP networks, other operators or other service providers, uh, IP networks. and by by using those networks, uh, our handset, 5G, 4G, 5G handset can uh, download the file and we can enjoy uh, YouTube uh, through the internet. So we assume uh, this uh, network uh, and we can co we collect, we assume we collect uh, all the network data uh, in these situations. And this is a logical topology, almost the same as the previous slide. And use cases. And now, now we understand data set and network uh, topologies. And next we have to think about use cases. Here we have, we provided uh, three uh, scenarios and a couple of uh, use cases here. And scenario means uh, network failures. Once network failure occurs, the network uh, status or uh, the data uh, will change the state uh, depending on uh, network failures. And by learning such data uh, from normal state and abnormal state, we, can, we will be able to uh, create some uh, model for uh, 
and estimate the failure, uh, what failure occurs. So we provide a sample uh, scenario around information failure, interface failure, and network element failures. And each scenario has a couple, uh, a few use cases. For example, uh, road, road information failure, we uh, assume BGP injection, BGP hijack, uh, meaning uh, inject, inject anomaly route from other service provider according to um, some reason. Some reason uh, means some reason. And uh, in terms of hi BGP hijack, uh, we assume hijack the own origin route by another service providers. This is a very intentional uh, situation. And also, uh, we assume a couple of uh, use cases of uh, network, network element failures, such as interface down, packet loss on an interface, delay packets on the interface. And lastly, uh, we also assume network element reboot, uh, meaning unplanned reboot of a network element. This may sometimes happen uh, due to uh, memory leak or other uh, external uh, uh, cause. And, and I attached a couple of uh, explanation slides but, but uh, time is uh, tonight. Part time is uh, limited. Please refer uh, those slides uh, since uh, the presentation file will be uploaded in the in the in the uh, site. And lastly, I would like to introduce uh, the data set, data set samples. And if we look at failure management uh, data set sample. Uh, we put a uh, unique key and we put the information, failure scenario, and failure execution start and end time, and start and date and time. By using uh, these information uh, along with the uh, various uh, data, data set, from uh, networks, we can uh, create your model and teach uh, the model by using those data. And if you look at the virtual infrastructure uh, data set sample, we have also provided a unique key uh, in, the, in the file. And you can see a bunch of uh, data. In, in a file. And lastly, we are at the same as uh, previous uh, samples. Uh, if we look at the in physical inter infrastructure sample, we have uh, also indeed unique key along with the uh, various uh, uh, data. So, uh, so uh, the same as uh, network device sample is the same as other uh, samples, as I mentioned. And lastly, I would like to uh, participants to some how 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 to submit uh, the, the result. And please create and train a model of AI machine learning by dataset for learning and verify the performance of the derived model by the dataset of evaluation in terms of anomaly detection and the root cause analysis. Submit a PowerPoint file with a video format indicating uh, the result and the, the demonstration video showing predicting performance. I provided the contact information uh, of uh, email, but I heard uh, there is a Slack channel uh, which is provided by ITU. So we may communicate, uh, we may be able to communicate over a Slack channel. So this is uh, the last slide. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Uh, thank you so much for the brief introduction of the uh, problem statement. Now I would like to invite uh, Iwai San from NEC to introduce the problem statement, uh, the second one from Japan. I'm Takanori Iwai from NEC Corporation from uh, Laboratories. Our research team aims to optimize the research related to uh, mobile network with AI. And our control target is wide ranges from base station radio control to media traffic control. So today I will introduce you about our new challenge network state estimation by analyzing raw video data. Uh, this page is agenda. Uh, let's move to the introduction. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, to the importance of interactive live video streaming services, for example, teleworking or remote work by using web cameras have been increasing. Uh, there are not only so many over the top services, but also the interactive <coughs> video streaming service in the internet, the heavy congest situation must deter irate quality service, quality of service and quality of experience. <coughs> Sorry. For avoiding such congestion in the internet, reducing video traffic is required. Uh, here, at first, we focus on the differences between these two kinds of services in terms uh, of video traffic reduction. In case of services provided by OTT, for example, Netflix, YouTube, and so on, uh, they uh, decrease standard resolution from 720 to 480. On the other hand, in case of interactive services, for example, Zoom and so on, consumers can uh, determine the resolution depending on the player setting. However, there is a problem to solve. Who needs to know network state? OTT services providers need to know network state to optimize the quality, and they can get it directly. On the other hand, in interactive services customers cannot the network state directly. That means interactive video streaming service first passive network state information for control video traffic to customers. As you know, video images by the internet depend on network states. RTP are communication protocols suitable for live video streaming services. Using web cameras is used here. Video images quality, example noises, depend on the network condition. Good quality video seems to good network state, while a bad file, bad quality video, which has block noise, video styling and so on seem to be a bad network state. However, we cannot understand the detail of actually what happens in the network. Here we show an example for video images. The left one is the original video, the right one is received videos by a bad condition network. As you show, uh, block noise appear. Uh, we can find the video quality is bad, but uh, however, we cannot find the details. For example, the loss rate is 0.1%. Conventionally, many researchers have estimated network state by using key performance indicator, for example, bit rate, playback buffers, and so on. However, in practical cases, such as teleworking, low video image is important for customers. Thus, this challenge is, first step is to understand the relationship between low video images and network state. Uh, let's, I would like to move to details challenges. In order to achieve the challenge, we have prepared a raw video data set 
this data set includes two types of videos, original video and receive one. We employ open video data set, for example, YouTube, as original videos. The received videos are generated from the original videos by adding network noise in our laboratory. The goal of this challenge is estimate network state, for example, throughput and loss rates from given raw video data sets by using machine learning based methods. Here, we show assume the training process and test process. In training phase, you train your machine learning method by using the video and its network conditions. In test phase, you estimate network conditions, the videos by using training machine learning methods. Uh, next page data set. Uh, our video data set consists of group of videos. One group consists of original video and received video videos, which are generated from the original one by adding these network disturbs conditions. Traffic rate from this 1,100 kbps to 2,000 kbps at 100 kbps intervals. And uh, the five options are used packet loss ratio. Each original video, video has identifications. Uh, you can download our data set from rising website. The size is 24 gigabytes and includes for the files. All submissions will be evaluated in terms of performance measure and technical excellence for each of throughput and low ratio. A mean absolute error values are calculated as a performance measure we are in the number of the test videos. At the end of the section, we uh, describe how to submit. Participants need to submit only reports, source, source code or extraverse file are not needed. The report includes the following item at least. First, explanation of your method approach, second, evaluation result, results for provide the data sets. Finally, the consideration the, about the results. A report format is a PDF, A4 size, uh, four pages at most. At most. The before and the rest is the information. Uh, the details of information is the challenge is this here, and if you have any question, please contact by email. Thank you for attention. We hope about that you will be joined that this challenge. Thank you. I uh, thank you so much for the brief introduction of the program statements. So now we are going direct into the Q and A session. So I welcome my colleague Vishnu to take over uh, this session to answer the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas, and uh, thank you, colleagues uh, from Japan, for the excellent talks. I have some questions which are already here, and we are slightly running out of time. So I will jump into the questions. Uh, first question seems to be for uh, Otani-san, which is asking uh, the use cases which you mentioned, are they predi all prediction use cases or are there uh, maybe other types of use cases? I think uh, Otani-san, you mentioned about um, uh, root cause analysis type of uh, use cases also, which are not entirely prediction use cases. Did I get that correct? Could you please clarify? Yeah, I think the question is that uh, the, the use cases uh, that Otani-san explained, are they all prediction use cases or are there uh, other 
types of inferences which are being done like for example uh, uh, classification for example so th that is the question uh, i think otan san mentioned about uh, root cause analysis which may not be entirely prediction could you please explain okay so i think it's best to uh, look at the problem uh, statement in a web page that uh, we introduced but uh, in this uh, problem uh, you know this is about uh, the uh, the failure cause analysis and uh, you know it's actually uh, um, generated uh, data and using that data the network status of uh, failures this operation so uh, you know they, they evaluate uh, you know this um, you know create a model and evaluate uh, this uh, failure and this operation what caused this uh, abnormal you know uh, situation so in that sense uh, it's uh, it's more like a prediction but it's more like uh, you know seeking the, you know the cause of the the problem so but uh, i think it's best uh, for uh, otani san to answer this question but i also looking at uh, the this website may help the, uh, the the person who asked this question Thank you, thank you. Uh, now that now that you are here, uh, Makawa Sensei, I want to ask you one question in the explanation that <laughs> you had made. Uh, uh, I think you, your your packet classification you are running on packet gateway because you have access to the payload. Uh, uh, I know the headers, the headers in the uh, packet headers in the packet gateway. But what yes. happens if the if the user is using a VPN? Uh, would the would the solution still work or not? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. So even if uh, so, the you know I have to use this uh, slide to uh, you know better clarify this uh, question. So because uh, we uh, the supervising data is on top of uh, encrypted uh, packet. So if you look at this picture. The application tag uh, for uh, you know generating the supervised data is after encryption, like a VPN, uh, you know tunnel. You know probably you know it's gonna add an encryption over this uh, packet payload. But uh, we attach this application tag here and a feature extraction and a match up with this application. Okay, so application tag means that basically it's a name of the application is uh, attached here. So matching the application name and this uh, packet, uh, 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 you know, uh, encrypted, for example, a VPN packet is there. So it's a matter of, uh, you, know, you know, inference over encrypted packet and of course, uh, packet payload uh, may, in this case, may not work, uh, you know, uh, well for uh, uh, inference. But the header information, like a packet size, the sequence of the packet uh, uh, length, you know, those uh, features, superficial, you know, uh, uh, features uh, could be used for uh, uh, application identification inference. And our uh, result shows that even over encryption, so our method is still uh, works. So in fact, 80% uh, of the TCP traffic is, is now uh, encrypted, uh, the statistics say. So we have to develop uh, the method, uh, machine learning method that works over encrypted packet. And uh, th thanks for a great question. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I should have explained this in, in my talk, but you know, it's a, it's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I want to ask a question to Yamamoto Sensei about the data set that uh, for his problem statement. Uh, I think this is a Japan round problem statement. Uh, are these uh, data sets which you, which you have for your problem statement, are they already there in the uh, in the Japan uh, link, or uh, or is it coming? Could you please explain? So, J Japan round uh, data set. So for Japan yeah, round, yeah, uh, the, the data set for the problem statement that you explained. Mm -hmm. So in this uh, theme, theme three, uh, 
we don't offer a uh, data set. So uh, we, uh, so each, uh, oh, yeah. uh, each attendees need to prepare their own uh, data set and also prepare the uh, machine learning uh, programs. And uh, they, uh, each uh, attendees need to uh, check uh, if their own uh, machine learning program can be work well for other uh, attendees' uh, uh, data sets. So, so we don't uh, uh, prepare a data set be beforehand. That, thank you so much. Uh, actually, uh, actually, now that you're here, Yamamoto Sensei, I think I want to ask you about your problem statement. You had you had explained uh, uh, the power prediction. I I think you mean uh, the uh, downlink power in the UE. Did I get that correctly? You're you're predicting the downlink power. Uh, in my work. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, in my work, uh, uh, this is a, a case of downlink, uh, downlink distributed power estimation. Um, but I guess uh, it is also applicable to uplink because uh, such uh, signal degradation can be uh, is affected by uh, human body blocking. So it is the same for uh, uplink and downlink. So I believe this can, approach can be applicable for uplink and downlink. Thank you. Uh, so that means that the handover decision algorithm that you are running, uh, that is in the, could be in the base station as well as, uh, where, where do you run the handover decision algorithm, please? Uh, in this case, we assume uh, uh, access point to a base station conduct uh, such uh, decisions because uh, uh, such uh, access point or base station have such uh, image information. And also, they have a uh, uh, distributed power, uh, distributed power information. So uh, it is easy for base station to conduct such handover decision. But uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, if users, clients have such kind of information, <laughs> video information, of course uh, they can determine. But uh, I guess uh, base station. Uh, uh, Base station determines such uh, the scenario of base station uh, uh, determination is reasonable, I believe. Thank you, thank you, Yamamoto Sensei. One last question before I hand over to Thomas uh, to Iwai san. Uh, the uh, about the data set. Are you uh, do you do you classify the data set into test and training data set, and uh, when do you uh, what kind of classification you have for test and uh, training and test data sets and uh, when do you release uh, and what is the, what is, could you explain about the test and evaluation for uh, the models according to your problem statement? Our performance measure using the MAE. So uh, each data sets uh, challenges and uh, Estimate for per original data or received data is network performance, and our performance measure is using MAE for collecting uh, answers uh, to data answers values, for example, a loss rate or a throughput. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think there are several interesting other questions which we could discuss, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we are we are running out of time. So once again, from my side, thank you so much for patiently answering these questions.